Money ain't it funny. Everybody wants it. Most people don't have enough of it. Rich or poor, money impacts our lives. So my first question to you is, has money become a false idol for you? Or is money simply the energetic flow of substance? Today we'll contemplate our views about the mighty dollar. Most of us think money is the answer to our prayers. We have this interesting relationship with money. I could probably ask you about your personal relationships and you'd be willing to talk to me about them way more than if I asked you how much money you made or how much debt are you in. How many of you have a thousand dollars for an emergency? Because that's about the average of what an emergency runs these days. So according to CNBC.com, only 41% of the people had enough money or assets that they could liquidate to get it. You see, there is a myth. The American dream can be achieved through hard work and determination. We have bought into that belief for such a long time that we have created financial stress and insecurity through buying material things to prove to ourselves and others that we are successful. But the reality is that as long as there is income inequality and minimal equal opportunities for advancement, that dream is only available to a select few. And things have gotten much harder since the 1980s when President Reagan's economists came up with this trickle down policies. Reagan's economists believed that if the top 1% made all the money, that they would then share their wealth through capitalistic and philanthropic ways. Well, you and I both know that that is not the case, and today the wealth gap is exponentially greater than ever before. Did you know that the USA's debt is about $27 trillion? And then that kind of equates into the average debt per person is $90,400. Did you also know that consumerism is a construct to keep us distracted from what is our true purpose? Well, there's this video that I want to show you that's by Norm Chomsky, is a laureate professor of linguistics at the University of Arizona and professor emeritus at MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He has also written more than 100 books on topics such as linguistics, war, politics, and mass media. And he shares in this video how corporations control us, control the masses through marketing and consumerism. Advertising industry, which is dedicated to creating consumers. It's a phenomenon developed in the freest countries in Britain and the United States. And the reason is pretty clear. It became clear by, say, a century ago that it was not going to be so easy to control the population by force. Too much freedom had been won. Uh, labor organizing, parliamentary labor parties in many countries, uh, women starting to get the franchise and so on. So you had to have other means of controlling people. And it was understood and expressed that you have to control them by control of uh, uh, beliefs and attitudes. Well, one of the best ways to control people in terms of attitudes is what the great political economist Thorstein Veblen called fabricating consumers. If you can fabricate wants, make obtaining things that are just about within your reach, the essence of life, they're going to be trapped into becoming consumers. You read the business press, say, 1920s, it talks about the need to uh, direct people to the superficial things of life, like fashionable consumption, and that'll keep them out of our hair. Uh, 
advertising industry just exploded uh, with, with this as its goal, fabricating consumers. And it's done with great sophistication. The ideal is what you actually see today. Where, let's say, teenage girls, if they have a free Saturday afternoon, will go walking in the shopping mall, not to the library or somewhere else. The idea is to try to control everyone, uh, to turn the whole society into the perfect system. The perfect system would be a society based on a dyad, a pair. The pair is you and your television set, or maybe now you and the internet, in which that presents you with uh, what the proper life would be, what kind of gadgets you should have, and you spend your time and effort to gaining those things which you don't need, and you don't want, and maybe you'll throw them away. But that's the measure of a, a decent life. Uh, the point is to create uninformed consumers who will make irrational choices. That's what advertising is all about. Uh, and when the same institutions, PR uh, system, runs elections, they do it the same way. They want to create an uninformed electorate which will make irrational choices, uh, often against their own interests. And we see it every time one of these extravaganzas take place. There's very little discussion of policy issues, and for very good reason, because public opinion on policy is sharply disconnected from what the two-party leadership and their financial backers uh, want. Policy, more and more, is focused on the private interests that fund the campaigns with the public being marginalized. You see, membership in the middle class is tenuously based on perceived membership gained by consumer activities. Debt serfdom and zero assets does not equate to middle class. The reality is the middle class owns almost none of the financial wealth of the nation and thus its resilience in the face of economic adversity is as wafer thin as its real financial wealth. Whatever you feel you need in your life, that thing has the power to control you and money is often the thing we feel we need. So here's what's ours to do is to identify and eliminate belief systems that are no longer supporting us. I want us to focus these next couple of months on really looking at what are our beliefs around money, our beliefs about prosperity and abundance, and then, if it's necessary, shift them into a way that allows us to thrive. We will look at our prosperity consciousness in several layers. What are our beliefs? What are our spiritual teachings? And how do we embody these principles to live the life we deserve? Our co-founder, Charles Fillmore, reminds us of this. God, which is the source of all, must be discerned and relied on while our dependence on material things must be eliminated from thought. So long as you depend on money alone, you are worshiping a false god and have not discerned the light." End quote. And that is from his book, Prosperity. And what I really want to emphasize is that there is no blame here. Please hear that. There is no blame because we have been indoctrinated in our society to believe that having money and material things are the very definition of abundance and prosperity. Ours is to challenge those beliefs that keep us enslaved to dependence on jobs that don't fulfill us or have anything to do with our divine purpose. Maybe right now, 
You might be thinking, this is not an inspiring Sunday talk, Rev. Cherie. And you know what? You may be right. But here's what I know. My calling isn't to give you a talk that allows you to feel good during the week, but doesn't help you to evolve in consciousness. My purpose is to invite you to challenge outdated beliefs, outdated ways of looking at the world or actions that are preventing you from being your highest good. And then, and then I call you into applying spiritual truths, spiritual practices to truly create a wonder filled life. Everything we do, we must imbue it with the energy of substance from source. That is the only way to create an energetic flow of abundance. And guess what? One of the ways that it's really easy for us to do this is by the act of tithing. When we make God our partner in this financial transactions of our lives, we keep the channel open from source. And in the ideal, what that allows us to do is manifest in the realm of things. At least, Fillmore reminds us that that is a spiritual truth. And in this spiritual energetic flow, where there is no lack or not enough, there is prosperity, abundance, the overflowing of riches beyond the simple idea that many of us have bought into that having money means success. It is clarity that we are living lives of joy, supporting our brothers and sisters and actualizing our divine purpose that lets us truly know that we are prosperous. I hope that you will join us on Wednesday evenings. We're going to start a book study this Wednesday, November 18th, and we're going to continue it on every Wednesday. As we work through Dr. Maria Namath's book, The Energy of Money, I've chosen this book because it's a spiritual guide to financial and personal fulfillment. And I want you to thrive. I want you to know prosperity. I want this community to flourish. And in order to do that, we've got to look at how do we view money? How do we look at prosperity? So this week, I invite you to read the introduction chapter, which goes up until page 36, and then join us on Wednesday at 530. And it only lasts an hour. And guess what? If you don't complete the reading, still attend, come on in, because we are going to have a juicy conversation. And I can't wait to be on this journey with you.